a it's difficult to take a lot of like a, a sample of the entire population so that's why we have samples so that's what this is going to talk about the different things that we can do to make sure we have a good sample so um so this is what kind of what i was talking about so a census versus a sample survey so census would be if we were able to take the entire um population and take information from it that's why you know you have the u.s census which is literally when you take all the information from uh, every single member in the United States or whatever. And uh, like it says here, it's more difficult to conduct, obviously, because we have to go through and, you know, have every single person, you know, we, you literally have to get to every single person in order for it to be considered a census. So what we usually do instead in statistics is a sample survey, which literally just means that we take a group of people out of that population and then make inferences about the population based upon that. Um, so yeah, so our sample survey, that's always going to be chosen by the researcher. And then um, what we want to make sure is that it's, so if it's a survey, it is going to be observational um, because, you know, it's based upon like who responds and whatnot. Um, but that's what all a survey is. But we'll talk a little bit about how to, if it's experimental later on, but that's um, the main difference there. Um, okay, so when we have sample surveys, once again, we have our sampling unit. And our sampling unit, all that is, is going to be um, the individual that we're looking at, whatever the measurement's from. It can be anything, you know, the person, if we're looking at, you know, a business or something, um, it's going to be whatever each individual unit is. And then our population is going to be our entire um, group that we have, so what we're taking the samples from. And then uh, the way we measure populations, the measurement of it is called a parameter. And then the measurement of a sample, if we hop down to the bottom, as a statistic. So the samples, you know, what you take out of that population. And then our sampling frame is going to be our uh, list of the sampling units from where we took that survey from. So, you know, you have your population, you take a sample from it, and that's going to be your sampling frame, the sample you took. But then if you give a survey, you know, your sampling unit is going to be each person basically who responded to the survey there. Um, so that's the main difference between a sampling frame and a sample. Okay, and then we have um, the margin of error, which our margin of error is trying to figure out um, consistency. So um, that's another word for reliability. I like to um, just so it makes sense. So reliability is the same thing as consistency. And then, um, so yeah, it has an inverse relationship with sample size, which means that, you know, as our reliability goes up or as our margin of error goes up, um, well, technically as our, our sample size goes down, then our margin of error goes up. So then we have a larger sample size, we have a smaller margin of error, which makes sense because we want to have um, a small margin of error. We don't want to have a lot of room for error. So in order to do that, you would want to get a larger sample size in that case. All right, and then we have, um, so if we're talking about doing samples, um, there's two different ways that we can do samplings. Um, so these are two different methods. Our first one's just probability, which means that when we take the sample, each um, individual, like part of it, they have the a known probability of being selected. You know, so if you, for example, if you have four, um, four blocks and you put them in a, a bag and you take one out, each one has a 25% chance of being selected because four of them, 25 or 100 divided by four is 25. So that's probability sampling. Um, and then our non-probability sampling is going to be things um, such as the sample surveys that I was just talking about, which means that basically you don't know the probability of someone being selected because it's kind of like it's self-selected. It depends on who responds and whatnot. Um, you know, so convenience samples, which is basically just taking whatever sample you have available to you. And then um, voluntary response, the same idea, you know, whoever decides to respond to the um, survey there. All right, so probability um, sampling methods, basically these are talking about um, the different ways that we can take samples. Um, so and remember, these are the ones where there's a known probability for each um, individual sample that we take. Um, so simple random sampling literally just means that you take a sample and it's randomized. You take a random amount of um, samples out of it. Um, and then systematic, I just want to um, skip the middle two because those are the, the tougher ones that we'll go and talk about. Um, systematic is something like you take like um, one every, you know, you take a sample one every 10 people or something. Um, so there's some sort of like rule that you do to take those samples. And multi-stage basically means it's like a 
a combination of any of the above, you know, so you can maybe have, you take a simple random sample and then out of that sample, you do a systematic sample, then you take like one out of every 10 people, whatever. Um, so in stratified and cluster, you know, I, I understand these ones are kind of tough to wrap your head around. Um, so stratified sampling, basically, you're going to um, take your population and put it into groups based upon a certain factor. Um, so this would be when you had a factor that might change the way that the, um, like your outcome. So for example, if you are trying to find information about all the, all the towns in um, Pennsylvania, but you realize that each town has a different population. So if you took like a hundred people from each town, you know, that wouldn't be good because for example, that can be like an entire town for one of the towns, but then that can be like 1% of another town, you know? So that's when you take stratified sampling. It's basically to, um, you know, X out of that variable that could um, influence the variable that we're actually trying to measure. Um, so, and then from each of those um, strata that you get, you take a simple random sample and then um, it's going to make the, the groups that are more different. So have different populations um, to be more similar so that it makes sense for us to do that. So just a summary of that, you're going to divide um, data that's already the same into um, individual strata take a random sample of each, and then out of all those random samples you get, that's gonna be your sample. Um, so that basically shows that you took a proper amount out of each one that makes sense um, to you. Um, and then cluster sampling, same idea that you divide it into groups, but the groups are already gonna be heterogeneous. They're already gonna be different from one another. You don't have to go through and, um, you don't have to do first, you know, take strata out. All you have to do is take different, um, take different groups, but they're gonna be simple random samples already. And then since they're already randomized and heterogeneous, then you can use all of those, um, all the clusters together. So there's basically like one more step um, for stratified sampling. Um, and the reason we do it is because we have kind of like uneven groups um, and there's another variable that can change it. Um, so main difference there, we are um, analysis done within each strata. Like I said, for stratified sampling, when um, for cluster sampling, you don't need to first divide into strata. Um, it's just the analysis done within each cluster then in that case. All right. And then like we talked about um, non-probability sampling, that's going to be the ones where we don't have a set probability for each um, sample, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so volunteer samples, that's one where it chooses itself, basically whoever volunteers to respond to your survey or whatever, that's going to be a volunteer sample. Community sample is taking, you know, whatever you have, whoever you have. So for example, if you're trying to find out um, information about all state college students or all Penn State students and you only, you know, have, you only take basically a survey from the people you're in class with, that would be a convenient sample because that's kind of all you have available to you. Um, so there's a high chance of bias because for volunteer samples, usually the only people who volunteer to do the survey are going to be people who are like passionate about the subject. So that's going to show bias then because people who didn't really care aren't going to respond and then they're not being represented there. Um, and yeah, they're similar to observational studies, ones that uh, you can just look at. And that's like the ones I, I like to like people watching. You literally just like take data based upon something that's ha like what you're just watching. You're not putting any treatment on or anything. So that's non-probability sampling there. Okay, and then our, um, lastly, our variables. These are the different things that out of those samples, basically what the different variables in them are. So we do have our explanatory variable, which explains the difference. That's why explanatory explains the difference in the response variable. So your response variable is whatever outcome you get. And then, so, and to describe them a little bit more, our explanatory variable is gonna be independent. Um, that doesn't change, it's not relying on anything because in order for it to predict our outcome, we can't have it be variable. We wanna make sure that it's um, independent. And then our response variable is gonna be dependent on the explanatory variable because that's gonna be explaining the outcome or that's gonna tell you the outcome, which is explained upon the explanatory variable. So for example, um, you can have maybe the amount of chocolate you eat in a week and then your weight at the end of the week. Um, so the amount of chocolate you eat is the explanatory variable because that's explaining the response variable, which is your weight, the outcome. Um, so yeah, and confounding variable and treatment, all that's talking about is a confounding variable is like I was saying, like, for example, um, if there's that population, when we were talking about the populations in the towns, you know, a confounding variable could be the um, original population in each of the towns or just something that you weren't trying to study, but then you ended up finding it, you know, that's what you found out. <clears throat> 
Um, so that's what that would be. And then a treatment, like I was talking about before, observational studies, you're not imposing any sort of treatment, you're just watching. And then for a, um, so an ex uh, experiment, an experimental study, that's when you would impose a treatment. So um, giving someone a medicine and seeing how they react to it. So you're imposing a treatment. That's how we describe that there. All right, so let's do some review questions here. Um, so our first one we have, so in a survey of uh, sample size 400 randomly selected Americans, a polling organization asked, do you favor eliminating Saturday mail delivery to lower the price of a postal stamp? In the sample, 54% answered yes, and the margin of error was reported to be plus or minus five. Which statement about the margin of error is correct? So go ahead and read through these and type your answer in the chat box, and then we will review it together. Okay, so for this one, if we walk through, I like to go through like each question to kind of describe why it is correct or why it isn't. Um, so for A, it's saying that there's a 95% chance that, so we, we're gonna understand that this is the correct part because they all say that, um, that the sample and the population proportions, um, which we, we are talking about proportions. So C can't be correct because we're not talking about um, percentages here. We're talking about um, the proportions. So differ by more than 5%. This isn't um, correct because it's saying more, that's not what we want. Our margin of error is talking about less than. So we, that's, we think that that's basically the max. We think that our margin of error is plus or minus 5%. We think that's the max it differs from. So that's why it can't be this one because we're trying to, we want the 5% to be the max. So it shouldn't be more than that. And then B isn't correct because um, we're not talking about the, a chance of the being the proportion there. And then, um, like I said, C can't be correct because we're not talking about the percentages. We are talking about though 95% um, chance of the sample and population proportions differ by less than 5% because you're trying to find your sample, um, your sample proportion. And then, like I said, we're trying to make inferences about our population, but based upon our sample proportion, we're basically saying that um, we believe that our actual population is within um, this basically technically like 10%. So, um, cause there's negative five, our margin of error is down here. And then, so it's our negative margin of error basically and our positive margin of error. So, and this is why it would be less than five because we're saying that we think it is basically within this group here. So does that make sense why D is our answer? Uh, yes, it does. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. So let's do. Yeah. All right, let's do another one. So a national poll wants to determine what percent of all Americans favor a change in the delivery to reduce the cost of postal stamps. A random sample of 1,000 Pennsylvanians was obtained from a list of all Pennsylvanians. What is the major problem with this survey here? So go ahead and try to figure out what the answer to this one is. Awesome, good job. Yeah, so our answer is A here um, because in this case, the poll excluded all Americans that are outside of Pennsylvania. So um, that's the wrong sampling frame. It's not a volunteer sample because they took a random sample. So that's why it's not B, not convenience either because um, once again, that's an observational study. And since this one is gonna be an experiment um, and it's randomized, and then um, D is incorrect because they, you don't have to do that in order to do a survey. So that's why A is the correct one because they used the wrong sampling frame. Um, they didn't go outside of Pennsylvania in order to find information about all of the US there. All right. All right, so number three, a researcher wants to estimate the proportion of Americans that favor a change in delivery to reduce the cost of postal stamps. He randomly picks 10 Americans from one from each of the 50 states for a total sample size of N equals 500. What type of sample is this? So try this one out and let me know what you think. Mm -hmm. 
Perfect. Great job. Yeah. So these ones are tricky. So you're doing great. So this one is going to be stratified because in this case, um, each of us states is going to be, so each state. That's the grouping. And then he's pulling him from that. Yeah, so each of these are a strata, and then um, the 10 Americans are randomly selected from each state. So we have 10 random um, from each state. So that's gonna be um, when we're taking that from. So, so yeah, it's gonna be stratified there. Not simple random, because they did first um, take you know 10 Americans from each of the things. They didn't just take um, a random amount of 500 people. So um, not systematic because you're not taking like one of every whatever people in the cluster because they initially picked 10 from each of the 50 states. They didn't just um, take a random sample from each of the 50 states. So it is stratified there. So good job. All right, and let's do one more here. So which of the following is a research strategy that limits the researcher from manipulating the participant's environment in some way? So go ahead and check these answers out. Let me know what you think. Good, great job. Yep, so our answer here is gonna be C um, because that's the only one in which the researcher can't manipulate anything. They just pe people watch basically. Margin of error doesn't make sense because that's a not necessarily a research strategy. That's just something you get from research and randomized experiment. This is actually good. This is where you have a manipulation. Uh, so that's why that one's actually good. So that's why um, our answer has to be C because this is one where you don't manipulate. Um, so that's why it says it limits them from manipulating. So, and obviously not all of the above, because just see. All right, great job. All right, so let's, um, so yeah, basically, uh, if you wanna go check these out uh, on all the other reviews that we do this semester, you can go to the YouTube channel, which is also on the notes page. Um, our next group review will be next Thursday at 8.30 for uh, lesson four. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. If not, you are good to go for tonight.